the question relates to um, an incident told about in both my book with Dennis, uh, Invisible Landscape, and in True Hallucination, yeah. creatively agitated under the influence of mushrooms, announced that he could do something, which is very hard to describe what it was. It was sort of like turn himself inside out, trigger the end of the world, uh, open a doorway into hyperspace, something like that. Anyway, some highly touted dramatic thing. He organized an experiment to test the theory, and the result of the experiment was not nothing, which was what I was betting on, not what he said would happen, which what he was betting on, but a very peculiar uh, incident then was generated where he seemed to uh, lose his mind, to put it simply, for about three weeks, but in a very specialized and orderly way. And I seemed to uh, also undergo a, a, a parallel but different kind of transformation. And the theory that was being manipulated was a theory that involved using vocally produced tones to acoustically cancel metabolizing psychedelic molecules in the body so that they would bond uh, as dimers into DNA. In other words, so that they would intercalate into DNA. The hypothesis which lie behind all this was that DNA must be the storage, the physical storage site for memories. This is not a popular idea. This is a sneered at idea. But um, it, memory is a great problem for modern science. Uh, you know, we've decoded DNA. We've got the top quark. We've measured the core temperature of Betelgeuse. We have no idea how memory works. It's absolutely confounding uh, because a, a, a woman, a man of 90 years old can remember the way their great-grandmother's skirts smelled when they used to crawl up into her lap when they were four years old. It was 86 years ago. During that time, every molecule in the body has been cycled out every five to seven years. So it's ten bodies away is the body that crawled up into that woman's lap and could smell the starch in her skirts, and yet the memory is completely clear. Where are the memories? And as you know, uh, uh, experiments have been done with ablating large parts of the brain or studying people who are the unfortunate victims of very traumatic head injuries. And there are cases in the me medical literature of people who have fully 80% of their physical brain destroyed and no memory impairment whatsoever. So where are the memories? Well, uh, there are a number of theories but there is nothing more than theory at this point. Dennis said, let's assume nature is conservative for a moment. We know that nature stores protein code in DNA, and we know that DNA has large silent portions. And in fact, some of you may have seen the data which came out just recently, that those large silent portions of the DNA uh, exhibits the same uh, mathematical properties as language. Did you all read this? Oh, this is hot news, folks. As you know, DNA codes for protein. That code is only about 6% of the DNA chain. The rest of the DNA, the other 94%, is called silent DNA, or by some people, junk DNA, because it doesn't code for proteins. So what does it do? 
Well, recently they've been sequencing this junk DNA and then studying it with algorithms used by the CIA to detect code in noise. And they discover that the silent portions of the DNA fit all the necessary criterion of language. They have syntactical structure. This seems to support Dennis's contention, which was, and it's very, it would be very controversial, you see, because it's a Lamarckian mechanism. It's saying that experience can modify nuclear DNA, which is denied by anti-Lamarckian evolution. That's not the way it's supposed to work, according to Darwin and the neo-Darwinians. Uh, nevertheless, uh, if we don't believe that it, the only part of the body which is not traded out many times over the course of a long lifetime, the only part of the body which you are born with and die with is neural DNA. Neural DNA, what you're born with, you keep. Therefore, it's reasonable, following good scientific method, to hypothesize that the neural DNA must be where the memories are. Well, then Dennis's idea was that ordinary experience has to do with serotonin uh, dropping into a relationship of bonding with DNA and, vi and giving off a signal, like a radio transmitter, of the structural hyperfine ESR of the DNA and that that then constitutes the electrobiochemical foundation of the experience of thought. And so what he was saying was then what these psychedelics are is they're like different kinds of, of transmitters, stronger or transmitting in different wavelengths or transmitting with a higher bandwidth and it is known, in fact, that these psychedelic molecules do compete with serotonin. They are serotonergic competitors. So visualize the DNA in the course of metabolism unfolding and folding itself to expose various runs of nucleotides to ribosomal coding into RNA. And in this, in this molecular environment, these drug molecules are whirling around and by Brownian motion or by enzymatic delivery, it does, the details don't matter, they, these molecules intercalate, meaning they slip neatly between the nucleotides. Many drugs do this. This is known. Uh, but most drugs or compounds, when they intercalate into DNA, they, they distort the twist of it and it, it's dysfunctional it messes up the thing can't transcript anymore these drug molecules if you look at them they're usually a, a pentaxial five-sided central group with a, a two uh, benzene rings or a benzene ring and a partial benzene ring hanging off of this thing and they're flat it's flat they're planar it means if you could blow up a psilocybin molecule to the size of a cutting board, it would be about as thin as a cutting board and as wide and as long. Those flat molecules fit right in between the nucleotides. Yes. And when this happens, uh, the electron spin resonance signal is amplified just as though a more efficient a transceiver had been dropped into place. And w you can measure the hyperfine ESR signature of DNA in, a, in an in vitro laboratory situation. This is not mysterious. So the idea then is that we have a family of molecules, endogenous neurotransmitters like serotonin, acetylcholine, so forth and so on, and exogenous neurotransmitters like psilocybin, DM, uh, DNA, I'm sorry, psilocybin, mescaline, and then exogenous endogenous like DMT found inside and outside the body. And it may be that what the evolution of consciousness is, is the slow trading in 
of low-gain molecular transceivers like serotonin for much more broadband high-gain uh, molecular transceivers like DMT. So Dennis's idea was to take all this theory that I just laid out and then use acoustically produced vocal sound to cancel uh, the charge of these molecules. And as you probably know, or maybe you don't know, when the, they, when the, uh, when a molecule becomes superconducting, it will bond into anything. It becomes a hyperbonding uh, molecule. It will bond anywhere. So theoretically, if you could cause uh, psychedelic molecules during their act of being intercalated into your genetic material to become superconducting, even for a moment, they would lock in permanently. And you would begin uh, to have uh, a very deep, a much deeper experience of consciousness. It would be much broader, much deeper. He claimed he could do this, but he also went further and claimed, and this is where I am not good at explaining it because I didn't understand it then and I don't understand it now, but he claimed that the, in the act of becoming superconducting and intercalating, this thing would cause the molecule to undergo something which he named, he called it dextrorotary, uh, hyperdextrorotation, which means simply that it would turn inside out and he said then that you would produce something, and, you know, I'm embarrassed at the strangeness of the concept, but that you could in some sense give birth to your own soul, that something could be generated out of your body which you would have a high degree of personal identification with because it would in fact be the central essence of yourself. It would be... He made analogies to the philosopher's stone, to the flying saucer, to the birth of an idea. It's the idea that you could create what he called translinguistic matter. That means a form of, an ontological form of being which looks like matter, but which behaves like mind. Uh, and, and that somehow this would trigger uh, the collapse of, his, of the illusion of history and everything would be swept uh, into the presence of Almighty God upon her throne or something like that. Anyway, that was the notion. And in proceeding to carry out this experiment, which I just thought was madness and would result in nothing, and then we could go back to botanizing, uh, instead, it... it in a sense, it seemed to work. The condensation of the philosopher's stone and the collapse of the historical state vector uh, is slightly delayed, but the rest of it seems right on track in that when he began, when he threw the switch, as he said, the harming switch, he went bonkers, basically, for about 21 days in a very complicated way which he had anticipated. He said, there is a small chance that I will be turned inside out, not my body, but my mind. And it seemed as though that was precisely what had happened. He could, he could recite the alphabet backwards. He spoke in a language which, if you got him to spell it, you could turn it around and you could see these were full sentences, uh, but spoken backwards. In other words, he, he truly seemed to be running backwards while we were all, the rest of us were running forward. Well, after about 21 days, that faded and he got his act together and went back to get multiple PhDs in molecular biology, pharmacognosy, and what have you. Coincident with the throwing of the switch, I, who had been the skeptic, noticed that it was, it was as though a switch had been thrown in me. And I began to understand 
it was not like any drug I'd ever taken. It was not like psilocybin or ayahuasca. There were no hallucinations. But what began to happen was I simply began to understand faster and faster and faster and faster, so fast that I was just walking around on these jungle trails holding my head going, uh-huh, I see, yes, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. And it was opening up ahead of me. And uh, I, eventually this understanding settled down into the theory of the time wave, which I will not slay you with because this is a course in psychobotany, not a course in megalomania revealed. Uh, but, but what I finally came to rest with was a complete model of space and time, as, which is what you would end up with. If, if he had succeeded, he said it would condense into three-dimensional space and end history and everyone would leave their factories and offices and discard their clothes and with tears of joy streaming down their faces begin to form the cosmic round dance that precedes the departure for Alpha in Sagittarius. Well, that remains uh, a future promise uh, to be redeemed. But what happened to me was I obtained this strange idea out of the I Ching uh, that offered me a complete model of space and time and the future and the past and from, has continued to be the touchstone of my intellectual life. So I think that, you know, we can argue for hours, although it's probably not worth doing, about whether anything at all happened at La Chirera. I was there. I should mention, I didn't sleep for 11 days. And it was the most amazing 11 days I've ever had. I, I was absolutely ecstatic. I barely ate. And uh, I, I was full of compassion and understanding for everyone and their limitations in this terrible dilemma because we were, you know, a thousand miles up the Rio baboon asshole with no airplanes and no radios and here my brother proceeds to go nuts and I'm saying it's okay but the world may end in a few days and on and on. Um, it took me about five years to get myself publicly presentable. In that time my, I was a burden to my friends and a joy to my enemies because I just appeared, I appeared to be a social menace, you know. I could back people into a Denny's and hold them there for 16 hours at a stretch with a rap so alarming and appalling that people would just back to the wall to wait to see if I was going to explode. Uh, it was simply, it, it takes a long time. You have to leaven it with humor and self-criticism and convince people that you don't take yourself seriously and all these things to make it palatable. Uh, yeah, that is true hallucination. And I think that, you know, if you want to read an eye-opening book, if you haven't read it, read Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution. Because what you'll learn there, to your amazement, is that these great intellectual breakthroughs like Newton and Einstein and, and Planck and so forth, they don't come out of careful examination of the evidence and conservative adumbration of theories and all. No, they don't come like that. They come like revelation. You know, completely, and then you argue backward to convince your colleagues. You go out and you get the evidence and you argue backward and you convince everybody. And then everybody says, well, it was obvious all the time. And anyway, they knew it 50 years earlier and on and on and on. But that, that's what you have to do. So I uh, have stuck with this, uh, my devotion to psychedelics, because it gave me really my greatest wish, which was I want to have a, a complete understanding of how things work. That doesn't mean there is no more surprises, but it means you, you at least have a, a structure 
that you can pour it into. And I think this is what shamans do. They create a personal ideology sufficient to their needs. And my needs are complex because I live in a society where I'm going to be talking to quantum physicists, mathematicians, historians of science, epistemologists, so forth and so on. So I, I had, it had to perform at top speed. If you're in a rainforest situation, in a culture, in a monoculture, then it, it is perhaps not so challenging. But the point of all this is catalysis of ideas. You know, culture can evolve no faster than its language. It can evolve no faster than the models that it can set up for itself to achieve. And that requires language. So I take the psychedelics to be catalysts of language. They probably caused it to come into existence in the first place. And then they continue to push it forward into new domains. And this great period of creativity that we're living through now in the sciences, in the arts, in the implementation of exotic technologies, I think this is the real legacy of the 60s. The people who run these fancy computer companies and the World Wide Web and the NET and CERN and all that, they're all freaks. They're all people who came up through the 60s and have somehow fitted themselves in uh, to straight society. But the great bulk of creative work is in the society in those areas is being done by people who took psychedelics. And in fact, arguably, the, the scientists of today, the, the technological implementers of today, are in fact shamans. And we are creating a kind of culturally validated shamanic superspace, except we call it cyberspace. But all we're doing with the creation of cyberspace is hardwiring in a male way what has always been there in a female way. I mean, the, the web of invisible hidden associations that make us the cosmos instead of the chaos. Well, that seems to be an overlong answer to a question I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs>